Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Savvy Cast. This is Jamie, and I'm thrilled that you're joining us today, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast. If you are following me on any of my platforms, you know that I have begun and am fully enjoying the process of buying wheat berries and milling my own grains into flour. And I'm loving it. And I'm having so many questions from many of you who want to know more and you want to be informed before you make a purchase or before you dig into everything. So I have got just the person to educate all of us on all things grains, milling, and just creating your own healthiest version of, of your food at home. My guest today is Gary Levitt. He is with Nutramil, and Nutramil Plastic is the number one selling grain mill in the world, correct, Gary? That's correct. <laughs> and you also, but you're the exclusive um, seller of the Bosch That's Universal. The here. Bosch, yes, because Bosch uh, is where you started, correct? Uh, actually, we started with Mills. Uh, okay. Interesting history, and I won't bore everybody with all the history, but uh, the man who first started this business was an incredible man, Bob Peterson, an incredible entrepreneur. If you're ever familiar with the old Franklin Planners, you know, that everybody- Oh, my goodness. Cool. Yes. Very involved in that. And you're ah. Color changing t shirts that you buy in resort towns that change colors in the sunlight. Oh, that was his brainchild. Wow. And his wife wanted to mill grain. And so he researched, and the number one selling grain mill at that time was a mill called the Magic Mill, built yeah. like, by a little old man in his garage in Filer, Idaho. Mm -hmm. He went up there to buy his wife one and ended up buying the company. And Oh wow! Uh, he thought, well, if I'm going to sell grain mills, what do people do with them? And obviously the number one reason people buy a grain mill is to make bread. Yes. And there's other, obviously other uses and reasons. And so he started researching and found out that the highest rated bread making machine in the world was a German mixer called the Bosch, the Bosch mm -hmm. Universal Kitchen Machine. He flew Which I have and I love, yes. Yeah. He flew to Stuttgart, Germany. Literally, not literally, but figuratively knocked on their door and said, I want the exclusive to your machine for all the U.S. and Canada. They shook his hand and gave it to him. And that handshake lasted 12 years. And then we did it under contract since then. But wow, incredible company, incredible story. Bosch, Bosch is a podcast. Uh, yes, it is. All by yes. Itself. Bosch, <laughs> Bosch. Yes. Now, our, and it's correct that if you want this Bosch Universal you have to go through Nutramil. Well, we have lots of resellers. Uh, you have, okay, but they get it from you. Yes, every Bosch Universal comes out of our warehouse. In, comes in, out of your warehouse. In North America. We're okay. The, an exclusive distributor. And for those who may be new to this, if you start baking bread, you will very quickly learn about the Bosch Universal because a KitchenAid, not to bash KitchenAid, they have their place. But if you start, well, would, why don't you articulate why a Bosch Universal is something you will end up buying more than likely if you start making bread? If you're a bread maker, Bosch is really the only choice you have for really good kneading of bread mm -hmm. and not having to finish it or knead it by hand. KitchenAid, I will never disparage KitchenAid. They lead the world in selling kitchen machines. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the U.S., they have probably a 90% market share. Uh, but for bread makers, do you remember uh, James Beard? Oh, uh, yes. You know, there's a James Beard Foundation. They yeah. sell the James Beard Cooking Awards. Yeah. James Beard called the Bosch kitchen machine, the only kitchen machine in the world. And this is a direct quote. The only kitchen machine in the world serious about making bread. You can put your ingredients in the Bosch and in eight to 10 minutes have bread ready to 
put in loaf pans, rise and put in the oven. From milling to out of the oven, you can do it in an hour and 10 minutes. That's amazing. And I will say, Gary, my neighbor who inspired this journey of mine, <laughs> she gave me a recipe that required the Bosch. I, some of the things I've been making are I just hand need, but... I worked so hard. Everything was sourdough from freshly milled grain. It was eight cups of sourdough and it did not turn out great. It wasn't the mixer's fault. It was mine, but her, her version of it is the best bread I've ever tasted. It makes five loaves at a time and I will master that, but I've never seen anything like the Bosch. It's like a big bowl that you can just see down in it throw all your stuff. It's beautiful to watch. It is a, it's something else. It's a piece of machinery for sure. Yeah. It's been the number one rated kitchen machine in the world. Oh, probably since the early fifties, mid fifties. Uh, they developed it actually about the year I was born, 1952. So oh. that'll give you a clue of the old yeah. guy we're talking to today, but it was built as a bread maker primarily. Uh, they, developed this very unique dough hook system and a tubular style bowl. It's the same size bowl as a KitchenAid Pro, six and a half quarts. But rather than using the bottom, almost half of a KitchenAid bowl is the only capacity it has because of the top drive style. Wash, you can use it all the way to the top. You can use all six and a half quarts. You put that unique dough hook in and every four rotations, processes 100% of the dough and it simulates and they built it to simulate hand kneading. So you know how you fold, stretch, and fold. Tuck, fold, stretch. That's to get oxygen into the, to the dough mixture. Mm -hmm. The only way you develop gluten, and I know the, some of your view is either gl even gluten is a bad word and mm -hmm. it's not. Gluten mm -hmm. is protein. And to develop the gluten that gives the bread the stretch, you have to develop it with oxygen and the kneading process. The boss does that in eight minutes. Uh, Julia Child said to make good whole grain bread, you have to let it rise a third time because you just can't knead it by hand enough to keep developing that gluten. The boss will do that third rise, which takes about two hours just in the kneading, rising, kneading, rising process. The Bosch will do that in eight to 10 minutes. So are you telling me that if I made just basic sourdough bread, that I could do it and skip the stretches and folds? Sourdough is a different animal. Yeah, it's a different so, animal. Mm -hmm. uh, sourdough and whole grain rise breads with yeast uh, are very different. Sourdough doesn't need a lot of stretching. Sourdough uses the natural yeast in the sourdough, mm -hmm. the natural rising capabilities. And you can do that with a lot less agitation. You can use the stirring mechanism in the Bosch. Just use the pulse switch and stir it and then let it bubble a little while. Stir it again, let it go, stir it again, and then take it right out. It doesn't require the same type of kneading that whole grain breads with yeast do. Well, that leads me to, because some of my people are asking questions that I want to direct to you because I want to make sure that I'm answering them correctly. When you get a grain mill and we can talk about, I have both, I have the classic and I have the harvest. They are very different. And everyone watching and listening, I will include in the show notes either the actual video or a link to the video where I do a side-by-side -side comparison. I will just tell you, I know your classic is the number one selling, but I consider it more of a workhorse that, you know, I personally would not want to leave out on my kitchen counter. The Most harvest. People feel the same. Right. But I'm going to show my YouTube people this harvest. And it's, this is something that's sort of a badge of honor. If you have this on your counter, Look at this. This is gorgeous. And you can choose the band it goes on top, the custom color, and then the spout. I mean, it's just gorgeous. And this is what my neighbor has. And when I first saw it, I said, I'm going to, I'll have one of those soon. I'm going to get one of those. And I will say, other than the fact that I do enjoy grinding 
cornmeal from popcorn, which you cannot do in the harvest. If I were choosing and you could just choose one, I would choose that one because it's so beautiful. Would you agree that if you want to experiment with lots of different grains, even hard ones, you're, you're going to want to go with the classic? Oh, this is such a hard question, but let me just answer it as succinctly as I can. Okay. The classic has been around. We developed it in 1991 from an, it's, it's the sixth generation of our high speed mills. Okay. Okay. You can do almost 60 pounds of flour an hour. It's for people who make bread a lot. And it's basically a bread flour mill. It doesn't have the texture control that your harvest has. The harvest is our number one sell, number fastest growing mill. Oh, okay. Uh, since the pandemic, it's grown almost 400%. So you can imagine, and we manufacture those right here in little St. George, Utah. This is where we produce those mills. The bamboo, wow. the virgin uh, forest bamboo is coming out of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and, and the stones are German milling stones uh, made from corundum, the hardest surface, the hardest mineral known to man other than diamonds. So, you know, the stones will never give out on you, but they're so different in... You can only, as you know, you can only mill about 10 minutes with a stone mill. And then the mm -hmm. stones get warm and you have to cool they it. They get warm. So mm -hmm. the quantities are very different. You have much more texture control with the harvest. You can do cracked grains all the way to flour. The Which is important to, and you yeah. tell me if this is accurate. If you want to just basically bake bread with and do like a one-to-one -one ratio of all-purpose flour. Would you say just get the harvest because you can get the same consistency of store-bought flour, fine, and you can use wheat berries, and then you can just bake that way. If you're not wanting to get into all the other grains, would the harvest just be one that's just good for just normal baking with the best all-purpose that you grind? Yeah, you can get a little finer flour with it. If you're grinding with the classic and you want all-purpose flour, you do need to sift it. You have to sift your flour one time. And it, again, I think it's for people, quantity is the key. If they're wanting four, five, six cups at a time versus 24 cups at a time, the harvest will give you smaller quantities. The classic will give you bigger quantities. So it really depends on your baking habits, kind of. We sell massive amounts of both. Okay. Well, that clarifies, and I think I may need to correct something because I sort of emphasized if you really want to make cornmeal, you're going to have to buy the classic because the harvest, will you can't put popcorn in the harvest. Well, you can put dent corn, field corn, as long as it's good and dry and, and okay. have a lot of moisture. I'll just make one quick correction. Yes. Correct <laughs> me, please. I speak with zeal. But not always, <laughs> but not always accuracy. True cornmeal is kind of a rough ground corn. Okay. The classic will give you corn flour. The harvest you can get cornmeal. You can oh. actually get really gritty cornmeal because you have more texture control. That is amazing. I'm so glad you told oh. me that. I'm gonna <laughs> have I'm gonna have to redo some content. I've started in this business in 1979 and I'm learning every day and it just takes a lot to master you know what our our whole mission has been since I started in this business and since my predecessor Bob Peterson started this business is to get people eating whole foods getting yes. more whole grains in their diets our early mission statement was Appliances and products for better health. And that was our mission statement for 25 years. Can you, and then I want to get to some of the other questions I've gotten, but so if you have the harvest mill, can you use popcorn or you would want to use only the dent corn? You can use popcorn, just feed it slowly, but those stones will handle everything up to pieces of metal. You oh can, my goodness. You can handle even little rocks that sometimes you find in grains, it just turns them into rock dust. Oh my goodness. It's very hard to uh, ruin those stones. They're so, you know, corundum is extreme on the hardness scale, diamonds, and then corundum. 
But if you oh. ever needed a replacement, you can get. Yes, we replace them if needed. The biggest cause for replacement is people who mill too long in a stone mill. Mm -hmm. Stones stones have uh, great grinding ability from cracking wheat to flour. Mm -hmm. Heat builds up in the stones. And as the heat builds up and it fills the stone with heat, then it, you start getting a glazing effect on the stones. And if your stones glaze, they need to be professionally unglazed, picked and cleaned and scrubbed. And we do that all the time. And sometimes people glaze them so bad we replace the stones. Okay. Your viewers need to know that it's got about a 10 minute milling cycle before those stones are too hot. Then you start again, let them cool down. And Gary, and I feel like this is probably accurate. If you realize that um, once you grain berries into flour, then they start deteriorating in quality. Sure. Now, of course, you can freeze the flour or mm -hmm. uh, you're not. I don't think you're supposed to refrigerate it, correct? You're supposed can we refrigerate to... flour. You can? Okay. Yeah, for a few but, days, it doesn't hurt. Okay. But if you have this harvest that I have, it literally, if you have all your stuff, like here are my berries. I have my berries on a shelf above the grain mill. I scoop them out. Feed them in for, and I do what I need. Right. It takes maybe five minutes. So to me, why not just do that? Unless you're just really needing a whole lot of flour for something. Yes. And I agree with you. And that's why harvest is growing so quickly. Okay. Now, a lot of our consumers are milling 24 cups of flour twice a day. Oh, what are they doing that for? Well, because they have six kids at home and they're making, and okay. the, Bosch, the Bosch will make up to 14 pounds of dough per kneading. And so they'll bake large batches of bread. We have small commercial bakeries who are just, you know, serving smaller communities that mm -hmm. are using classic mill and the Bosch mixer to do their baked goods for a small bakery. Good and too. that's, and so when I, I don't know, who you're cooking for and what your bread needs are, but it's all across the gamut. We, okay. sell, we sell to middle America and mm -hmm. we sell to really, we sell to people who are, you know, the homesteader movement, how big that homesteader movement has become. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a huge uh, consumer base in terms of the needs that they have for their families. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I do cook a lot, but I also freeze and I cannot tell you the joy that it brings me and other people that I give my bread to pull it out of the freezer, let it thaw and then heat it at 350 till it's, you know, warm throughout. And it's just like you baked it. Yep. People, you can't give a better, get people go crazy. They, they love it. Love that. Bread is, you know. And you're giving the gift of health. You're giving the yes. gift of real, real food because we eat so much processed food. Can you hold up that wheat canister again? I want to explain. I sure can. These are, this is einkorn wheat. Oh, an einkorn. It's an ancient wheat. So this that's is an what, ancient. Wasn't this on Noah's Ark? If probably. Yeah. It's a, the Germans use einkorn a lot still. But keep in mind, every one of those kernels, every one of those berries have 26 vitamins and minerals. When you grind them, you get all 26 vitamins and minerals out into your flour. Now, if you're using processed flour from the store, all of those nutrients, those 26 vitamins and minerals are gone in white flour. And the U.S. government stepped in, I think in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and said, you can't sell white flour. You've stripped everything out. It won't support a rat. So you can't buy flour that's not enriched in the store. So they take all those 26 vitamins and minerals out. They take the wheat germ, the bran, the oils, the vitamin E's. They give you white flour, and then the government makes them put, I think right now, 11 nutrients back in your B12s and your B1s. So they put chemicals back into your flour to call it enriched. Otherwise, they can't sell it. Oh, my goodness. And you know what one of the leading commercial sources of fiber, when you buy a 
high fiber bread in the store, human oh. hair is allowed as a fiber additive in bread. They buy it by the truckloads and train car loads out of China and other countries and the US, and they grind it, pulverize it, make it into a powder, sanitize it, bleach it, and they can add that as fiber. And the government's been allowing that for years. As to a even the better brands? Yeah, unless it's a homemade brand, but they can buy, you can, even these commercial bakeries, they can buy added fiber to add to their high fiber breads. Well, that high fiber can be human hair. That's one of the greatest sources of fiber that they do to commercially added breads. If someone wants to make their own bread and they want white flour, would you say all they need to do are buy hard and soft white wheat, let's see, what else, and just grind it to, to the finest consistency and it's the best flour you can get like you would get at the store, but better? Well, if you're buying double O flour from the store, you're buying bleached stripped flour with added nutrients back. Right. If you want that same white flour, buy soft white wheat. Okay. Pull it and then sift it. Just get a good little sifter. You can buy the little hand sifters or shakers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Shakers. Yeah. And all you have to do is just sift that the heavier brand particles out, and you'll get your double O bread flour. Which um, I've got three different sifters, and I never know because they're not marked. Do you know the whole size that you would need to? to I would think you would use a 60. We sell a 60 as an attachment for the Bosch mixer. Okay. You can put it right over the bowl, put your flour in it and okay. sift it directly into the bowl. Okay. A 60 sifter. If you want just to duplicate the very stripped of nutrients, white flour. So, and let me ask you this. A lot of us, have thought in the past, oh, I'm buying King Arthur, I'm buying organic, I'm buying Bob's Red Mill. And I love King Arthur. They're an amazing group. Bob's uh -huh. Red Mill is amazing. Mm -hmm. Organic is good. It means the wheat was grown organically. But if you're buying commercial white flour, the commercial process removes all of those things. And to sell it, they have to enrich it back. So there's no way around that. No. King Arthur, uh, I'll have to look at what their offerings are now. King Arthur actually had a pretty good uh, unbleached organic white flour, but still a lot of nutrients gone from it. Okay. So bottom line is grind your own. So for the person kicking the tires, what would you say? I, and one of my biggest tips, know where you are going to put your grain mill and know where you're going to put your berries and have it right there to get have everything together. I have a station in my walk-in pantry. And I'm telling you, if I didn't, if I were having to walk from one room to another or go pull the mill out from the garage, it, I wouldn't be setting myself up for success. But other than getting it all together and organized, what are some of your best tips, maybe first things to try? that you think will set them up for success? I think you hit it right on the head. You have to have a place where you know your mill is that you can mill uh, and it's handy for you. Mm -hmm. uh, storing wheat berries, as long as we're talking about wheat, because there's lots of grains, but storing wheat berries, keep them closed awesome. tight and away from uh, light and heat and moisture. Okay? Yes. And rotate yes. them. Uh, make sure you rotate them uh, and just keep them clean and handy. There's all kinds of methods people use. A five-gallon bucket, they make something called a gamma seal lid. Gamma seal lid. They're gamma fabulous. Seal, they're, because you can literally submerge it in a bucket of the whole thing in water and you'll pull it out and the wheat's still dry, but you can spin the lid off and use the wheat as you need it. The lid's so easy to get off. You wouldn't yes. believe you could put it's it under phenomenal. the lid. And a lot of us older menopausal age women, we have hand issues. And my, my neighbor tell me, she says, Jamie, make sure you get gamma lids or you will not be. And if the other lid that you have to pop off, it breaks, I believe. You can't put yeah. it back on. Well, and you bend them with, even with those tools you use, they can bend and disform mm -hmm. 
Gamma seal lids are the standard in the industry. They really are. Right. And okay. Well, so handy to use. Yes, I love I love mine. Okay. What would you say for some of your very okay, Sue Becker's bread book is Sue's been one of our phenomenal customers for 30 years. What a book. I mean, it, to me, don't buy a grain mill unless you're gonna buy her book with it. It's so informative. Yes. And Sue, I don't know if you know the struggles Sue's been through. We've had her speak at our conventions before. No. And Sue went through some amazing, incredible, hard, hard health struggles. And her and her husband, Brad, and their daughter, Ashley, and they have been just loyal supporters of this business from day wow. one. And uh, I think they're still in, they still in Mayretta, Georgia. I, I think that's what I heard. But I'm telling you, I she goes through every single berry, explains its history, its origin, how it's used, and then recipes. Sue's an incredible lady. I'm telling you, wow. So I made her Mexican cornbread, and with my Nutramil, I grained my own. Well, now I realize I grained corn flour because I used the classic. And that's okay with breads and, and certain things. Corn flour is actually really good. Okay. And I grind my soft white wheat. And yeah. I'm telling you, it's so different from bread that you're accustomed to. It's yeah. different. Well, and you know, you have my address. You can always put a loaf on UPS to me. Sure. Listen, <laughs> that's awesome. It was fabulous. So that, so what I recommend for people to do is get her book and pick three or four recipes that you know you would make more than once and then buy your berries according to that and, you know, get your grain mill. And then I think that it's the type of thing, there will be a learning curve, but once you've done it for five or six times, it's easy. It's easy. You want to hear a little secret? Yes, I, I love secrets. Very often now we're putting it on a podcast. The <laughs> first time, the first time I taught a bread class, okay, I had about twenty people in my class. I opened a store in 1979 to sell grain mills, which was the very first high-speed grain mill that we sold in those days, mm -hmm. and Bosch mixers because I just believed him. I had seen people do it. And I thought, I'm going to open a store and make this a business. The first class I taught was the first time I ever made bread. If you don't think that was scary. And I sold 10 mixers and like six mills in the class because it, the learning curve is not what people think it is. The Bosch will make bread for you. As long as you have good materials to put into your bread, the Bosch does all the work and it is foolproof. Yes. Yeah. Knead mm -hmm. until it forms a ball of dough and pulls away from the sides of the bowl. You'll have perfect bread every time. You mentioned something, and I want to address this because I do make and love authentic sourdough. But this, this is totally different. This is not really necessarily a sourdough situation. This is bread that you grind for normal recipes. Now yes. you can do the sourdough thing like I tried to do with all the starter and all that. And that's great. But I just want to ask you, this is just sort of a, and it's probably a very controversial question <laughs> that my neighbor, Cindy and I were talking about this because we've been in some classes, sourdough classes, follow some people who are very astute with sourdough. And there's a little bit of almost an aura of this is superior your own wild yeast is so superior to yeast that you would buy and add to grit but we were talking and she says do you think that it would be healthier if you had to choose gr grinding your own flour to just use in all different recipes instead of store flour or making your own authentic sourdough. And I mean, I know they're not necessarily a parallel, but a lot of people do not want to make sourdough and they're very sad about it. They don't want to go to all the trouble. They it's don't, it's trouble and it's time. Now I have an overnight recipe that is as little trouble as you can get, but 
would you say to those who are like, I just never want to do it. It's so much trouble. Well, this is an excellent, if not better alternative, because this will be something you put in everything your family will eat. Yeah, I'll answer that uh, as simply as possible. Sourdough starter as opposed to yeast is healthier, okay? Yes. But as long as you're using whole grains and whole grain flours, it doesn't matter much. Sourdough is like a phenomenon right now. And our, we sell a sourdough starter kit. We sell all of the sourdough stuff. We sell sourdough starter that a little lady in Texas makes for us in small batch quantities and then dries and we sell it so that it's easy to use and restart. Yeah. And we've got the little ramekins or the, the little uh, wicker bowls that they can use to do their sourdough. And all the things are in this kit. And people are still intimidated by it. But if you just say, is yeast healthier or is sourdough starter natural yeast healthier? Sourdough starter natural yeast is healthier. But so many of the people doing sourdough are making it with white flour from the store. And it's not nearly as healthy as making just fresh whole grain bread that you make with yeast. Not nearly as healthy. So to clarify, I want to make sure I heard you correctly. If you're just looking at starter, starter made with authentic wild yeast is healthier than yeast. Right. Yeah, okay. starter is a is a healthy natural phenomenon. Yeah. Sourdough bread made with authentic sourdough starter, but that is using store-bought flour is not as healthy as whole grain bread loaves made with yeast. Yeah, not nearly as healthy. Like and, not nearly, it's not close. And, and now people are really starting to learn to make sourdough with whole wheat, but it is a much more difficult process because you've got all that bran and all that fiber and all the oils and things. So sourdough is really simple with white flour, not so simple with wheat. Mm -hmm. It's still very doable. We have people all the time now doing it. Can you send some resources that I can share on my um, show notes? That's where I messed up with my friend's recipe. Hers was all sourdough with all fresh milled. It's brown and beautiful. That's where I think I messed up. Are there some really good resources that can help us make sourdough starter from freshly milled grains easily? Yeah. Well, I'll get those to you. Okay. Yes. Okay. What is your favorite grain and your favorite recipe made from whole whole grains? Uh, there's two, and I'll just because they're both very much the same. I really like kamut, and <gasps> kamut is an ancient grain, and it's easy to mill and easy to make. Just basic bread recipes from kamut, and I love hard white wheat. It was developed by Wheat Montana Farms, and I think they called it Golden 86. It was developed in 1986, and hard white wheat gives you just this same nutty wheat flavor, but a lighter, fluffier loaf. And so I use my foolproof recipe that I've been using since 1979. I can make it almost blindfolded. It calls for two-thirds cup oil, two-thirds cup honey, uh, you know, your water, your yeast, your uh, salt and all the other things. And instead, I put two thirds cup oil and one cup honey because I really have a sweet tooth. And Could you share that recipe with us? Sure. If, it, if you're making it in a Bosch mixer, it is so simple. I start with six cups of hot water and not hot that it burns your finger, but hot, you know. Yeah. And then I just cover that water with flour. I just cover it up. And once it's covered up, then I put in two thirds cup oil up to a cup of honey. And I put in my, and just dump my yeast right on top of that honey. And then I stir that mixture. And sometimes it depends if you don't know the source of your grain, when you mill it, what the protein content is or not, I will add a cup of gluten flour which is just okay. pure protein. You mm -hmm. drop that in. That way you're ensured that you have sure. a really strong loaf and strong rising. 
I just stir those ingredients together and just mix them together until they're blended. And then I just started, and then I put in a couple of tablespoons of salt and I use the real salt. Oh, uh, that's what I use. And I love Redmond's. Real salt. Yeah, Redmond's real salt. Now, my, do you use egg? I don't. Uh, in the If I was making a challah bread or something, you can use egg. You can, I'll tell you one more little secret. I'll finish the recipe. Okay. Stir that and then turn it on speed two to start kneading and add flour until it cleans the sides of the bowl. And once the sides of the bowl are clean, just quit adding flour. Okay. And, and then you can finish it in another eight minutes, take it right out and put it in bread pans and let it rise. It is so simple. And how many loaves does it make? Well, six cups of water will make about 10 loaves, 10 pounds of dough. And I make one pound loaves. So I'll make about 10 pounds of dough. So you make one pound loaves and do you, do you put those, that would not fit in a mini loaf. That would be like a Pullman pan or a. No, no, no. Just the little mini loaves are one pound of whole grain. Oh, you're making the one pound. Okay. Do you yeah, ever. I, I only use mini loaves. For me, they're the perfect sandwich size. They're the perfect snack size. And, you know, uh, when I had children at home, if I made the big loaves, you know, I'd give them a sandwich made of whole grain bread. And if it sat in their lunchbox for a minute, they'd eat mm -hmm. it. And the bottom half would start falling down. But the little mini loaves make a perfect size to hold and to make small sandwiches. And they're, they're almost like little slider size. Yes, and I love them. Okay. Now, the food nanny, I'm sure you've heard of her. Sure. She makes those mini loaves and she uses Kamut. Do you use Kamut ever in your recipe? Yes, kamut, spelt, einkorn, wheat. Mostly I use wheat. I use, I, I love the taste and the hardiness of hard red winter wheat or what they call turkey red. Mm -hmm. And I also, but I love uh, golden white wheat. What's so great about kamut? Because she says it's the best in the world. It's her favorite. That's all she does. I mean, what is so good about kamut? Well, she just lives up the road a few hours and Kamut is an amazing grain, high in protein. It's an ancient grain, so it hasn't been crossbred like wheat has. Oh, okay. And it's just um, the nutritional profile of Kamut and the mild flavor and everything is just really great for flour. It's growing in popularity. It's not as easy to find, however, as mm -hmm. wheat. Okay. I want to ask you this. To all of my friends and followers who so want to eat bread, but they are gluten intolerant. What's the solution for them? Is there a berry or, and that's. I'm going to tell you something that's a little controversial, but I've been preaching it for 25 years. Okay. There are only one uh, group of people who should not be eating gluten. And if they have celiac spore disease, that's gluten is, can be deadly for them. Mostly Scandinavian countries, there's only about 1% of the population, I don't remember the exact percentage, that are really celiac disease. Mm -hmm. Everybody who has gluten intolerance is because of the overload of white flour in our diets. I have worked with people who, I, I had a man that I was sitting on a committee with for something unrelated, but it was a food storage preparedness type of committee. And he said, well, I can't store wheat because wheat just causes all kinds of grief for me. I can't eat gluten. And I said, are you celiac? And he said, I'm not celiac. I'm just very gluten intolerant. I said, let's try an experiment. So I had him crack some grain. He just used his blender and hit the momentary switch a couple of times and crack because cracked wheat is really true. Cracked wheat is cutting a kernel of wheat into four pieces. And mm. I said, try a fourth cup of cracked wheat cereal in the morning with some sugar or honey or milk or whatever you eat with it. And just try that for a few days. And he came back and he says, I can tolerate cracked wheat cereal. Fine. Then let's just start working it in. He started eating whole grain breads again. He was gluten intolerant because the white flour that we buy and that we sell and that we consume is only just gluten with new added chemical nutrients. They take everything out and leave the gluten. And so you look at the grocery store shelves, your crackers, your cereals, your breads, your muffins, your cakes, your cookies, all of them are white flour. And our bodies are finally saying enough is enough. 
and we're that's they've written books about it the gluten mm. generation and gluten became a dirty word and gluten is wonderful it's a wonderful protein if you add the 26 vitamins and minerals that are attached to that gluten mm -hmm. and make it a whole food everybody who is not celiac can handle it work their way into it oh, i love that that's gluten, encouraging yeah gluten intolerance is I won't say that there aren't people out there who have that sensitivity, but it's because of the overload of white flour. Yet another reason to get a grain meal. Okay. Yeah. Where are, okay. I have bought from grand uh, Teton grains. Am I saying that right? Teton yeah. grains, ancient yeah, grains. Uh -huh. And then I have bought from Azure Standard. Azure is wonderful. They're wonderful, but you know, you've got to wait a month, you know, in between. Are there other places that you can just order it and get it shipped to you other than ancient grain, Teton? Yes, you've got uh, Azure, which is wonderful, but they have that delivery system. They wait a month. Palouse grains, uh, you'll find them actually on our website. And it's because they can deliver to you in all 50 states uh, just within a couple of days. They have a wonderful delivery system. So, Palouse, oh, P-A-L-O-U-S-E, and you'll find them on our Nutrimill.com website. And okay. uh, when you buy it off of the website or buy it directly from them, it's the same. It ships from them. Oh, okay. And, uh, so we partner with both Azure and Palouse. Uh, Wheat Montana Farms, in, but you have to buy bulk from Wheat Montana Farms throughout the Three Forks, Montana. And people buy them by the truckload. Also, I have a question. Yeah. French salt. Now, I do use real, Redmond's real for the baking part. I, I do finishing salt, Maldon. But the food nanny keeps talking about this French salt. French but salt. Can, can you only get it from her? She's adorable. I mean, I'm fine getting it from her. But is that something like my William Sonoma gal who I always use her. She says, we have French salt. Is it the same? It's the same. Yeah. French salt is a, they, the way they gather it and get it is just different. And salt is salt, but there are, you can get so many different varieties and flavors and iterations of salt. I like some of the pink Himalayan salts. You yes. Uh -huh. Really good black salt that comes out of the uh, uh, South Pacific. There's just some fun salt. I use Redmond's, but I use all kinds of salts. I have pink Himalayan salt in my cupboard right now. Um, my friend and neighbor, I had to borrow some lecithin from her. Uh -huh. And she said, Jamie, it's all clumped up. It's very hard to keep this. So I just found some dough enhancer on Amazon and it's in a jar. Is that the same? And do you have to use lecithin or dough enhancer? You don't have to use either one. Dough enhancer, if you using whole grains, dough enhancer helps. We used to sell a dough enhancer until it got to be so expensive. We quit blending it right now. We're looking, we have our own recipe for dough enhancer that we've had since the uh, early 1980s. Mm -hmm. But right now with the craziness that going on in raw materials, you can find some good dough enhancers on the market. King Arthur sells a wonderful dough enhancer, for example. Oh, okay lecithin liquid lecithin in ter in place of oil is healthier but oh. li in liquid lecithin uh you can buy it in a hundred places including amazon you can use it in place of dry lecithin yes and okay. you can use it in place of oil in your recipe what is lecithin is it a seed yeah, it's and it's basically they press the oil out of it and dry lecithin. They just put it into a powdered form. Okay, so a nutritional additive. So would it be considered one of the healthy oils like avocado and EVOO? Yes, yeah, lecithin, uh, and I think Sue talks about it in her book. I think you'll find some stuff from Sue about lecithin. Okay, I'm gonna look at that, and this, the, I think this is my last question. I, when I make any bread calling for vegetable oil or corn oil, I use avocado. Sue did not mention avocado in her, no. but I've not had problems, but is that a problem? Never. Uh, oil is oil. Okay. There's healthy oils and not healthy oils. And avocado is a much better choice than a 
Crisco vegetable oil, for example, or blended oil. You don't want to use the healthier the oil, the better you're going to get a better product. Let me just say one thing about bread. Bread is the simplest thing in the world. And what most people don't know is that you only need two ingredients for bread. You need flour and water. And they say, well, that's not going to taste very good. No, every Passover, the Jews don't think so either because unleavened cracker bread, mm -hmm. yeah. that's flour. We grew up, I mean, in my church, we grew up every Sunday. That, uh, But but the, when we were children, we always tried to go in the back and sneak it. We thought it was good because it was <laughs> not for us. Yeah, it was, yeah, <laughs> it was forbidden, so it was better. Uh, yeah. But everything you add besides flour and water is only for flavor and texture. I've made some of the wildest. My employees said one time, you know, some of us have never made bread. Will you? So we have a little kitchen upstairs in the office and I took everybody up there and I said, let's make some bread. What would you like to make? You can put anything you want in the bread because there's nothing that can't be added to flour and water if you do it correctly. And they said, one of them kind of being smart said, well, make some candy bar bread. I said, great. So I made the bread dough and uh, just made the whole wheat recipe. And then I rolled the, it out like I was going to, you know, flatten and make like a pizza crust. And I cut the ends off and then made the slits like, for like a braided bread. And I yeah. stacked candy bars in the middle and then braided the candy bars and tucked it, let it rise and baked it. And it was delicious. <laughs> My goodness. Well, what I, I am last question, I promise, but what is your other than Sue Becker's? What's one of the best cookbooks for people who Ooh. are be using? I mean, or, or you can list more than one and you can even give that to me later today if you need time to think. But I personally believe that other people are going to be like me. If you're going to do all of this, you don't really want to adapt from you know, all your regular recipes, you would like to have some that are geared toward use this much freshly milled kamut or whatever. I mean, I just think that's handy. Yeah. Sue's is probably a great reference for everybody. Yes, it is. I'll tell you that there's one, and I don't know the author offhand. I'll try and get some of these to you. The Bread Bible. The Bread Bible is a great resource. Just like the Bible is a great resource for our lives. The Bread Bible is a great resource for our nutrition. Absolutely. And um, we have lots of recipes on our website. So <gasps> Nutrimill.com, we provide lots of great recipes. We've produced six cookbooks over the years. Uh, okay. We've had, I think we only have, and we give them away now primarily for what we have left because cookbooks are a dying breed because it costs you more to publish them than to just throw them online. Right. So- um, but there's some great ones out there. And well, I, I would love to buy those from you. I, I don't, I, I don't <laughs> like to ask for things free, but I would love to buy those because I, I still love turning the pages and making notes. I do too. And I still, I still read real books. I have to, uh -huh. this was my more, my morning. Reading. Oh, well, <laughs> then you sure don't need readers. I have the large print Bible and, and my kids laugh at me. It's so large. <laughs> Well, I, see it across I, have, the I, I have reader glasses. I, I could read it without that, but I still, I could read all of this online. I can pull it up on my phone. Yeah, yeah, but it's on my phone. But I just, I like to feel process. it. And I like to, as you can see, I like to mark it and color and mark up things that are meaningful to me. So, right. And I'm the same with cookbooks. I probably have a hundred cookbooks in my library and well, I, I don't really use them, but I just yeah. like them. I do too. And if someone wants to ask some questions of someone at Nutramill, do you have like a dedicated customer service? We do. We have two people always on customer service chat line. And if it gets really complicated, they can call them. We have Kathy and Emma who are wonderful. And sometimes they'll run upstairs and say, I got a question. I don't know. And I'll say, well, let me take it. So, well, I will tell you, my um, team has worked with Laura, I believe. Lauren. Lauren, Lauren. I meant and Lauren. Lauren is wonderful. Oh my goodness. My 
my person who I adore, who works with my brand relationships, she said, I have never, we're like best friends now. She's awesome. And yeah. she said the customer service, she said, that is such an upstanding company. They're just, and I can tell that by talking to you. And I feel like supporting, like I am not one that's going to search for, even though y'all's prices are great, search for something to try to find it on AM or whatever. I'm about relationships with the people that I work with and buy from. And I can tell that you all, and I, I do have to end on a funny note. I was Googling how to make cornmeal from popcorn and it was a YouTube of a homesteading lady and she was very funny. She she looked very homesteadish, just cute as could be, but she she was making the popcorn and she broke her classic. It like broke and she said, stay tuned. And she, you probably will remember, she said, and she came back, she says, y'all, I have an update. I called Nutramil just, the, the machine was 16 years old. She had been milling <laughs> grain for 16 years. I called them just to see what I did wrong. And I was planning to buy another one. I'd had that one 16 years. And the person kept saying, you know, that should not have happened. We want to investigate this. Please send that back. She says, I'm like, what kind of customer service would do this? This is amazing. And and she was just the cutest thing. And I didn't save it because I wanted to just share it with everyone. Y'all, who does that? That's amazing. Amazing. Well, I will tell you on the classic, there's a lifetime guarantee on those. It's not a grinding mechanism. It's an implosion. It's the, the, the micronized. Uh -huh. Micronizing. And the only way that that probably happened was a metal piece got in there, which will stop those teeth immediately. It can be as little as a BB or a screw or yeah. even uh, sometimes just a staple, you know? Oh, uh, goodness, yeah. So we we do have good customer service. I've prided myself from the day I started the company till now that, in fact, I used to teach a seminar all over the country called Relationship Selling. People buy from people and we have to be real. And I tell every one of our employees, when somebody spends two or three or $400 with us, they better be satisfied with what we sell them. And if they're not, we better make it right. And you know what? It all comes back. That's why you're the number. That's why you are. That's why you rank where you do in this, in this realm. And um, it, it's, it's a biblical principle. Treat others as you would want to be treated. So we have to. You know, just real quickly, and I know you have to go too, but oh, when, you, when you talk about relationship selling, there's only two types of customers, people who shop with you for the first time and people who come back. And that's the only two customers you'll ever have. And you can build that chain down. Someone who shops with you and never comes back, probably bad mouths whatever happened to them, whether mm -hmm. it's in store online or in person. If they come back, they came back because they either got what they needed, they felt warm, they felt accepted, they felt heard. And if they come back, then you better keep that going because that chain keeps going and it grows. And the ones that you build a relationship with, we are now selling Bosch mixers to great, great grandchildren of people who bought Bosch mixers from us. I was going to say, it goes down the line. Yep. Yeah. Goes down the line. And if somebody well, had a bad experience, it stops there. It stops. And they'll tell other people. Most people who leave Google reviews or reviews, are mad. they're either mad or they're thrilled. Yeah. They're never like, oh, let me go leave a review. So yeah. I've exactly. got it right. Oh, this has been absolutely wonderful. I would love to have you on again. I will wait for those recipes. Tell me how to get those cookbooks. And we'll do this again if you will make time for it. I would love it anytime. You're more than welcome. And, and it's been a pleasure for me. So thank you. Thank you. And until next time, all of you watching and listening, you have a fabulous rest of your day. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Savvy Cast. If you'll take the time to rate, review and subscribe on iTunes, that would mean so much. As always, thank you for listening and have a blessed day.